Uh, with that, let's come before the Lord as we get into our study today. Lord, thank you so much for um, just the, the blessing that we have in being able to gather in your name together as your church. And as we're here this morning, Lord, we know as your word says, wherever two or more are gathered, you're there with them. And so we know that you're here with us. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would speak, that you would just speak right to our area of need this morning, Lord. For those who need encouragement this morning, would you just bring that? For those who need um, a little bit of a, a, a rebuke or a reminder of this morning, Lord, would you just bring that? Uh, we just give you room to, to move and to speak this morning, Lord. And so give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to pick up uh, again in Philippians starting next week. The past several weeks we've been talking about Christmas. Uh, and then today we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the new year. But then next week we'll pick up uh, back up in Philippians chapter 3. But New Year's Eve is today, right? So tomorrow is a new year, 2018. And I just have one question. I've had this for the past three years. Where is my flying car? Seriously. Back to the Future said I should have a flying car by 2015, and it hasn't happened yet. So one of these days it'll happen, right? Uh, tomorrow is a new year. And, you know, although we know that a calendar date, you know, one day doesn't make a, a, an actual difference, uh, there's always something cool about starting a new year. You have uh, new chances, new opportunities. Many people think of it as a fresh start. Uh, lots of people set New Year's resolutions. Anybody in here have a New Year's resolution this year? Nobody. Okay, there's like three. Yeah. First service, literally nobody raised their hand, and I was like, okay, nobody has a New Year's resolution at all. Okay. There's a few. Um, a few people set New Year's resolutions, but, you know, I think the reason that not many people set them is because they're those things that we were like, oh, I'd really like to see this happen, but I know I'm not actually going to do it, so I'm not even going to try. Right? That's <laughs> just the reality about New Year's resolutions. You know, I was uh, looking up some statistics. This is gym membership's favorite time of year, like gym membership salesmen. They see an increase of 30 to 50% in sales in January. Kind of crazy. But the interesting thing is that 80% of those people quit within a couple months. 80%. 18% uh, of people who sign up for a gym membership in January will actually use it. 18%. That's pretty crazy. Uh, I also found that 45% of Americans set New Year's resolutions, which did not represent itself in this room. But 45% <laughs> apparently do. 52% of those people were confident that they would actually reach their goal. So 45% of people set resolutions, and only half of them think they're actually going to accomplish it. And the reality is that only 12% of those people actually accomplish their goal. 12% of the people who set New Year's resolutions actually see it happen, like 1 in 10. It's kind of sad, really, when you think about it. I mean, we set resolutions, we set goals because we desire change. We want newness. We want things in our lives to change. We're not happy with the status quo, and so we want to see things get different. But see, the reality is we fail to follow through on most of those things that we set as goals. And maybe you're here today, and you're in a place where you'd like to see some change in your life. I don't know what it would be. I don't know if you're looking for, you know, uh, you'd like to get healthier in the new year. Maybe, like, I want to cut out some sugar. I know that's me. There's, like, sugar everywhere I go during the holiday season. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to cut it out for, like, a month, right? And then I show up here today, and they have the white chocolate peppermint-covered pretzels in the foyer. Why do they do that? I told them they were fired if they brought sugar and they keep doing it. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe you're dealing, you know, with something different. Maybe it's like, I just like to get rid of my phone addiction. They found out that this is actually an addictive thing. It releases dopamine in your brain when you look at it. And so, like, it's actually, they say, more addictive than cocaine, the phone, Facebook, that stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe for you, it's you want to get your spending under control, or you want to set your budgeting right, or maybe um, you're dealing with an addiction that you'd like to see some success in overcoming, or maybe you want to start working out, or maybe you want to be a better parent or a better spouse, or maybe you want to draw closer to the Lord in your walk with him this year, and your goal, your desire is to press in and to get closer in your relationship with God. I, whatever it is, we all have areas in our life that we would like to see change. How do we get there? I mean, if the reality is that people who set those types of goals, only 12% of them actually achieve their goal. How do we go from a goal or a resolution to actually seeing that change happen in our lives? 
Because the reality is the statistics just show like, man, it's not going to happen. I could try, but it's not going to happen. Well, we get some insight in our text today, and uh, it's one of my favorite sections of Scripture, John chapter 15. You can go ahead and turn there with me if you have your Bibles. We're going to be in John chapter 15, verse 5 today, and I'm going to go ahead and read this for you. It says, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He says, I am the vine. Jesus is the vine. Now I want you to picture the scene here. Jesus is walking with his disciples. They've just had the Last Supper. They're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane as this is being shared. And so I, I kind of picture them walking through some vineyards. Jesus sees some grapes over there, and he points to those grapes and says to his disciples, see, see the grapes, see the vine. I am the vine, and you are the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now, we as believers in Jesus are branches on the vine. And he says, without me, you can do nothing. What happens when you cut a branch off of a tree or a grapevine or whatever it may be? It dries up, it withers, it dies. A branch can't bear fruit unless it's connected to the vine. It's kind of like... um, uh, you know, usually my family, we like to cut down our own Christmas trees and do it that way. But a couple years ago, we just had a really busy season. And we're like, we'll just go buy a Christmas tree, right? And so we went to the Christmas tree lot and we picked out like the most beautiful one we could find. It was like, this is an awesome tree. It's great. We got it home to our house, set it up, got it all decorated, had water in there. And for some reason, it didn't drink the water. I mean, I cut off the bottom. I did all the stuff you're supposed to do, but it wasn't drinking the water. And within like three or four days, the whole thing was dry. It was like crispy, Right. <laughs> And then after about a week, I went over and I touched it and the leaves, the little things started falling off of the tree. I'm like, oh man, this isn't good. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point where the branches started drooping and sagging. And like all of the needles, you could tell it was like, this thing is a fire hazard right here. And my kids kept asking me to turn the lights on. I'm like, I don't really want to turn the lights on on that thing. (laughs) I'm worried my house is going to go up in flames, right? And you go over and touch it and all the needles fall off, right? I'm like, oh, that thing is dangerous. And they kept asking for, for me to turn the lights on. I'm like, oh, we can't do it. So I'm like, okay, we just have to get a new Christmas tree, <laughs> right? Literally, I, so I went and undecorated the whole tree, which is a pain, right? Took all the ornaments off and I started taking it out and all the needles fell off the tree. So it was really bad and threw it out and got a new tree put in there. But see, the reason that tree was dry is because it wasn't connected to the root. It had already died by the time I got it. It dried up. It's the same for us. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We have to be connected to the vine, connected to the source. So you can't have a deeper, closer walk with the Lord on your own strength. You don't have it in you. You can't achieve those goals, those things that you're looking for, and sustain them on your own strength. You have to walk in the power that Jesus gives us. See, that's the answer right there. He says, he who abides in me... And I in him bears much fruit. When we abide in Jesus, when we remain, that's what that word abide means. It just means to remain, right? It's like stay connected is really what it's saying. So when we're plugged in to Jesus, we bear fruit. That's what happens. It's a natural byproduct of being connected to the vine. You ever think about what a grapevine does to bear fruit? Like does it have some special like, thing that it does in order to bear fruit? No. It just stays connected to the vine. It doesn't produce fruit. It just naturally comes out of it as a result of its connection to the vine. So Jesus is the one that actually does the work in us. We see in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the one that started the work in you. He's also the one that's going to finish it. See, here's the problem. For, for many Christians, this is how our walk goes. We uh, have this moment before we're a believer where we recognize that we are sinners, that we are in need of a Savior, that nothing's going to save us except for grace. And so God steps in. He saves us. We, look, we are like amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the whole deal. It's like, wow, God is amazing that he would forgive me, that he would save me in spite of all the stuff that I've done. There's nothing I could do to earn his favor. We get saved, and then somewhere along the line, we get this idea That now that we're saved, we have work to do. We've got to take care of stuff on our own. We've got to figure it out. We've got to work it out. 
And we start to do things to try to please God. We start to try to do it on our own. And see, here's the problem. You can't please God on your own. See, the thing that God accomplished in your life only by grace, we start to try to carry out on our own. We get the idea, okay, I have to try really hard not to sin. Or I have to try really hard to share the gospel. Or I have to try really hard to walk with God. Or I have to try really hard to serve or be involved in ministry. Or I have to try really hard to love this person that I don't really like. And the, the I makes it into our vocab. We start all these I statements. I need to do this. I need to do that. But see, the reality is Christianity was never about what you could do. It's always been about what Jesus did for you on the cross. See, it started with him, it finishes with him. See, I couldn't be good enough before I was a believer. What makes me think I can be good enough now? It's his work in me. See, otherwise we're trying to do stuff we're not equipped to on our own. Kind of like me with gardening. Like, I have a black thumb when it comes to gardening, right? Yeah, I try to work on plants and it just dies. That's just what happens, right? So like people will give us like a little potted plant or something like that, which is really nice. And it's like, okay, well, that should be pretty easy. All you have to do is add water, right? Somehow a week later, it's like shriveled up and dead, right? I don't know how it happens. It just does. I tried gardening one year. I actually was like, I'm going to do this. We bought the little gardening box, filled it up with soil, planted tomatoes and all these things. And all these little plants started growing up. I'm like, oh, this is great. It's going to work. Maybe I don't have a black thumb after all. And then a hailstorm came through and completely wiped out everything. Nothing. Nothing left. It was dead. I am not a gardener. <laughs> I can't do it. And see, we begin to do things by faith in God. We start with faith. And then somewhere along the line, we switch to thinking, I can handle this. I can do this. We do it on our own. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul the Apostle addressed this exact issue. I mean, his letter to the Galatians, sorry, not Colossians. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, he's speaking to this church in Galatia that had um, started well. They started in faith, and then somewhere along the line, they started thinking that they had to live out their religion and keep this set of rules and laws. And he says this, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And see, essentially what Paul is saying is this. Why do you think that you can finish what God started? Why do you think you can finish what God started? Are you better than God? Are you more powerful than God? Why would you try to do something on your own strength? See, apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. There's nothing you can do. Well, you might come before the Lord and say, Lord, I've been trying so hard in this area. I've been working so hard to get in the word. I've been working and trying so hard to do this thing. I mean, just, I keep trying, Lord, and I'm working so hard on it. But see, the reality is there's no such thing as trying for the Christian. There's no such thing. You can do nothing apart from Jesus. And when you're in Jesus, you can do anything that he asks you to do. Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it's one or the other. You either can do nothing on your own or you can do all things through Jesus. There's no try. It's like the, the, you know, Yoda, right? Like there is no try, only do or do not. I won't break out my Yoda voice for you because it's going to get ugly, right? <laughs> Just the reality, right? There's no try. You either do it or you don't. When you're walking in the spirit, when you're connected to the vine, you will naturally begin to do those things that you can't do on your own. You can do nothing or you can do all things. See, it took the, the power of God to forgive you for your sins. It's going to take the power of God to press forward in your walk with him. See, so often we try to do things that we're not equipped to do. 
We're not, we're doing it in our own strength. It's kind of like, like I think my life is a good analogy. I am a, like, a, I'm just an awkward person. And I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. I'm just an awkward person. Like if you run into me in the grocery store and like you leave the conversation being like, that was really weird. Maybe he doesn't like me. I promise it wasn't you, it was me. <laughs> I'm just an awkward person. Like I'm introverted. I'm a little bit shy. Like if I go to a party and there's a bunch of people there that I don't know, I'm the guy standing in the corner of the room looking at my phone pretending I'm busy right? That's just the reality of it, okay? I am an awkward person. And you might think, like, what are you doing as a pastor if you're an awkward person? You're getting up and you're talking in front of people every week. You're meeting with people for counseling. Like, that doesn't make any sense. You're right. It doesn't make any sense. (laughs) I can't do it on my own. It's definitely anything that you see in me is a work of God. It's not me. It's not me. Because when it it falls back on what I can do, it becomes painfully obvious, (laughs) that I'm not equipped for what God has called me to do on my own. It's like, I'm just awkward even in weird things. Like this week, we, I, have, I was playing with my kids and my daughter had this little, one of those little rubber popper things. You know, it's a little circle that's like a dome and you push it down and it pops up. Have you seen those, right? I think they have them in the kids' church thing. And I was playing with the kids and I stuck it on my forehead and I squished it in so it like suctioned to my forehead, you know? And I was just messing with the kids and then my son comes up and pulls it, tries to pull it off and it like pulls my forehead out And he pops the thing off, and it gave me a forehead hickey. (laughs) It was like a big red dot in the center of my forehead for like the whole week. If you look close, there's still a little bit of it there. I was like, what in the world, (laughs) right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to wear a hat all week this week, every day. Thankfully, the office for the church was closed. I didn't have any counseling appointments, although I'd be sitting there like, why are you staring at my head? What's going on, (laughs) right? I'm just an awkward person, but see, the power of God through you in whatever circumstance you are will equip you for anything he calls you to do. Apart from me, you can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So try all you want, but trying doesn't get the job done. Trying's not going to accomplish those goals. You have to be connected to the vine, receive your directions and your orders from him to be able to go where he's calling you to go and then be able to do what he's called you to do. And so the key to tapping into that, the key to, to moving from goals and, and resolutions and all those things to actually seeing that change happen in our lives lies in one thing, and it's right here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. This is describing what it looks like to abide in Jesus, to be connected in Jesus. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we're going to stop there for a second. So you look at that verse, and you're like, okay, let us run with endurance. I'm going to lay aside the weight that entangles the sin. I'm going to drop all that stuff. It sounds like a lot of work right there, doesn't it? When you look at that, it's all this work stuff. Let us leave all this stuff behind and you know, run with endurance. But see, that is the fruit of what we see in verse 2, where it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, it's when we fix our eyes on Jesus that we're able to do anything. When our eyes and our heart are set on Jesus, when we're abiding, connected, plugged in to Jesus, that's when we receive the power that we need to be able to do the things that he's called us to do. So our job is to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that started it. He's the one that's going to finish it. He started that work that's going on in your life. He began that work of faith that you're walking down. He's the one that's going to finish it. It's not you. It's him. So fix your eyes on him. See, when you're looking at Jesus, when you're fixing your eyes on Jesus, you begin to naturally do the things that he's called you to do because you're connected to the vine. See, a grapevine naturally produces fruit because it's connected. The branch is connected to the vine and the fruit grows as a result of the branch's connectedness. It doesn't sit there and try really hard. I mean, I always get the picture of like, okay, a grapevine trying to produce fruit. It's like, okay, here's my branches. Okay, trying, trying, nothing's happening, right? That's not what happens. 
fruit grows naturally as a result of the branch being connected to the vine. It's like the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When your eyes are on Jesus, on who he is, on his majesty, on his power, on his love for you, the other stuff starts to fade away, and you start to press in towards him, and that fruit is a natural byproduct of your walk with him. And so what is it that you're looking to see change in in your life today? What's the thing that you'd like to see change? Whatever it is. It could be as simple as starting to eat a more healthy diet, which is like a worthy goal. It could be as big as overcoming an addiction. It could be your spiritual walk. What is the change that you're looking to see in your life? See, the key to seeing the change that you would like to see in your life is being plugged in to Jesus as your power source. You've got to be connected to him. See, I have here, this is, a, this is an iPad. This is what I use for my notes, right? I, I put my notes on here so you can see them. That's like kind of how I see where I'm at in my message, all that stuff. And I left my iPad here this last week after our Christmas services. I was just like so tired after the end of the day. I was like, okay, I, I forgot about it. All week I couldn't find where it was. And I was like, what is going on? And I was so worried because I was like, I'm going to come in and the battery is going to be dead. Now, what is an iPad with a dead battery? Just a very expensive paperweight, right? That's all it does. It's not good for anything unless it's got a charge. See, when you plug it in and it gets powered up, then it can be very useful. It's the same with us. We can't do anything apart from our power source. We've got to be plugged in to the vine. We've got to be connected. We've got to get charged up. So whatever it is that you'd like to see fruit from in your life, wherever it is that you'd like to see God bring growth and change and power, you need to be connected to him. It's kind of like, um, I think of the illustration of like, picture your life as a glass of water, right? You are a glass of water, and your job as a believer is to pour yourself out for, for the Lord and for other people. So you're sitting there, you're pouring yourself out. Well, You've only got so much water in there, right? So you pour it out and then it's empty. No, you need to keep receiving from the Lord so that you can keep pouring out. You can keep pouring out if you keep receiving from him. It's kind of like those, you know, like the big champagne fountains or whatever where they pour it in the top and it fills up all the glasses down the row. That's the idea. Keep receiving. Keep your eyes fixed on the source and it'll keep flowing out of your life. So if we want to bear fruit... If we want to see God work and change in our life, we have to be connected. We have to remain in the vine. Now, this year's Christmas tree that we got, uh, we went and cut one down up off Hard Scrabble Road. And I got, we have a tall ceilings in our house. So I'm like, I'm going to get a big Christmas tree this year. So I got a picture of it. I'll show you. This is the one that we did this year right there. And you can't really tell how tall that is, but it's like, it's a very tall Christmas tree. It's like 14 feet tall. We measured it. It's like, you know, you see it out there and you cut it down. You're like, oh, that's a good size one. You get it home. You're like, wow, that's a lot taller than I thought, right? So I had to get up on a ladder and decorate it and all that stuff. But here's the interesting thing about this Christmas tree. We saw it off the road and I was like, oh, I'm going to go grab that one. I walked down to go cut it down. And when I got up to it, close to it, I was looking down the trunk for the, the roots so I could cut it off next to the base. And what I found was that this tree was not actually a tree. This tree was a branch. The tree had tipped over probably 10, 15 years ago, and the branch was growing like this out of the root. There was one long branch that was laying sideways across the ground, and this 13-foot tall Christmas tree was a branch that was growing off the main trunk. Now that tree, who knows how long ago that tree got tipped over, and it was this perfect-shaped Christmas tree just grew off this fallen tree. But see, the tree had its roots in the ground still. The roots were still connected, so the sap was still flowing, and so that branch shot up. What a cool picture that is of our walk with the Lord. You can get blown around, you can get knocked down. As long as you have your roots grounded in the Lord, you will continue to see growth, you'll continue to see fruit, you'll continue to see positive change in your life if you stay connected. Now, when you knock a tree over and the roots pull up out of the ground, it's going to die, right? But because this one had its roots in the ground, it still grew. 
Andrew Murray, who was a, a missionary to South Africa in the 1800s, he wrote a book called Abide in Christ, and it's talking about this concept. It's actually a 31-day devotional. It's a really great book. You can get it on Amazon called Abide in Christ. But he said this about uh, uh, abiding in Christ, which is what Jesus is talking about in this verse. He said, abiding in Jesus is nothing but the giving up of oneself to be ruled and taught and led, and so resting in the arms of everlasting love. Abiding in Jesus is resting in the arms of everlasting love. I love that picture. That's what it is. It's resting in who Jesus is. But see, so often our walk doesn't look like resting in the arms of everlasting love. It looks more like struggling to stay afloat. And so that's my question for you today. If you were, had to describe your walk with the Lord, if you had to describe what your Christian walk looks like, would you be struggling to stay afloat, treading water, or would you be resting in the arms of everlasting love? See, God wants to give you rest. He wants to be your strength. He wants to be your power. He wants to give you his grace so that as you focus on him, you no longer have to strive. Because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, we can be confident that God's going to finish what he started in our life if we simply rest in him. See, for the Christian, the new year is a, a fresh new opportunity to, to walk with the Lord, to set our eyes and our hope on him. So as we look forward to 2018, which is just crazy to say that, as you look at 2018, look at this new year as an opportunity to rest in Jesus and see the fruit that he produces in your life. Rather than all the stuff that you can try to muster up, all the strength that you can try to, to accomplish stuff, see what Jesus can do through you as you simply fix your eyes on him and rest in him. I want to close with this last section of scripture here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24 says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who will also do it. What he's saying is may God finish the work that he started in you. See, God started the work. God's going to finish it. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. Your job is simply to fix your eyes on him, to rest in the arms of everlasting love. And when you do that, you'll find that you will see yourself more productive. You'll see more positive change. You'll see more things going on in your life that honor the Lord than if you tried really hard because he's the one doing the work in you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your expectation of us is not that we would try really hard because you know that we can't do it on our own. You know that none of us are good enough. None of us can measure up. We, can, we can't do the things that we'd like to do. Just like Paul said in Romans 7, Lord, thinking back on his past experiences as a Christian that's not doing the things that he wants to do and instead is doing the things he doesn't want to do. Lord, that's us when left to ourselves. We can't. We're not able. We fall on our face again and again. That's why people set goals and only 10 to 12% of them see it happen, Lord. We want to be those that fix our eyes on you, allowing you to come in, allowing you to set our direction, allowing you to set our priorities, allowing you to set our goals, Lord. And when we do that, when we rest in you, Lord, would you give us that strength, that power to accomplish more than we can do on our own? Because you've called us to a God-sized work. And so, Lord, as we look forward to 2018, we ask that you would help us to set and fix our eyes on you, Jesus. And whatever we do in our workplace, that we would fix our eyes on you, Lord. In our schooling, that we'd fix our eyes on you. In our families, that we would fix our eyes on you. In our friendships and in our roommate situation and in everything that we do in life, Lord, may you be the center of what we do. Help us to see that you're with us everywhere we go, Lord. And if we'll simply rest in the arms of everlasting love, you'll guide, you'll lead, you'll direct, and you'll equip us to do what you call us to do. 
And Lord, I pray for anybody that's here today that's never put their faith in you. They've never put their trust in you to be forgiven, to be saved. Maybe this last year was a rough year for them. And they're looking back with regret or sadness. Lord, would you show them the incredible hope that you have for those who belong to you? Not just here, not just on this earth, but for eternity. That you've given us a hope and a future. So Lord, I pray for anybody here that's never put their trust in you. Right now, would you just speak to them your love, your grace, your mercy. Show them how much you love them. Show them what you did for them on the cross. And if you're here and you've never put your trust in Jesus, I just want to let you know that God loves you. He loves you more than you love you, more than your friends love you, more than your family loves you. He loves you more than any other person loves you. And see, there's a problem, and the problem is what we call sin. And our sin has earned us death, and it separates us from God. But God loves us. And so he did the only thing he could do. He became a man. Jesus lived, and then he died to be able to separate you from your sin so that anyone who will believe in Jesus can be forgiven, doesn't face death anymore, but can have everlasting life with Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you'd like to receive that, I'd like to give you an invitation to do that. Right where you're sitting, just between you and the Lord, I want you to take a second and express your faith in him. You can just repeat after me. Say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me. Please set me free. I want to be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand up together as we sing this last song. If you need prayer for anything, I'll be up here. I'd love to pray with you. The, the um, leaders will be up here at the front. We'd love to pray with you for anything you've got going on. There's no place I'd rather be 
more time, set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. That's a cry of our hearts, Lord. That we want more of you. We want you to increase in our lives and just cause us to decrease. We look to you because you are our source. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, I pray by your spirit, you would empower us to do the things that you've called us to do. And that we would look to this year with our eyes fixed upon you, expecting the best to come. Lord, we love you. And we go in your, the power of your spirit. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, have a great week. Happy 2018. Fix your eyes on Jesus. We'll see you later.